our praise to bring revival. We lift our hands, we lift our eyes up. Where your love is found, there will be no fear. God, your kingdom come, your will be done here. On earth as in heaven, Spirit of God, oh, our hearts are wide open. Jesus, we need you now. Come every way in this place, break our walls down. Spirit of God, pour out on earth as in heaven. Jesus, we need you now. We bring our shame, we bring redemption. You turn our chains into your freedom. kingdom come, your will be done here, be done on earth as in heaven, yes, Spirit of God, pour out our hearts to wide open, oh, Jesus, we need you now, come have your way in this place, break our walls down. God pour around on earth as in heaven. Jesus, we need you now. In your presence there is peace, and in your presence we are free. There's no better place to be. There's no better place to be, yes, Lord. In your presence there is truth, and in your presence mountains move. We forever run to you. We forever run to you. In your presence, in your presence there is peace. In your presence we are free. There's no better place to be. There's no better place to be. In your presence there is truth. In your presence mountains move. We forever run to you. We forever run to you, Lord. In your presence there is peace. And in your presence free. There's no better place to be. There's no better place to be. And in your presence there is truth. In your presence mountains move. We forever run to you. We forever On earth as in heaven, on earth as in heaven, oh, Spirit of God, pour out our hearts so wide open, Jesus, Jesus, we need you now, come have your way in this place, break our walls down, Spirit of God, pour out on earth as in heaven. Jesus, we need you now. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. That's right. We need you in this place, God. We need your presence to surround us. 
We need a word from you tonight. We want to hear from you tonight. God, we want to worship you tonight. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, you all may be seated. Amen. Amen. In his presence, we are free. There's no better place to be. Amen. Um, so thank you for coming and being here and being free. <laughs> Um, I just have a couple announcements. We have Family Weekend coming up. How many of y'all know about Woo! Family Weekend? Woo! We're so bangin'. There's one of them. <laughs> okay. This is Miranda O'Bangin over here, the lovely wife of David O'Bangin. And as you can see, uh, we have a cookout on September 12th. That's Saturday at their house. And there's all the information there. Now, bring a side dish. And I know my husband said bring enough to feed 20. You need to bring enough to feed 40. Okay. <laughs> bring enough to, bring, to, to feed 40 because we like to eat. And bring a chair. Bring your own chair. Woo! Woo! Okay. Woo! <laughs> um, so that is September 12th on Saturday. The next day, which is Sunday, September 13th, there is no a.m. service. There's no brunch that morning. Um... But that night, there is what we like to call the family night service. And it is awesome. It's an awesome time to encourage your family members, your friends, whoever, to come out for that night. It's a special night. I think every night is anointed here that we gather. But I think that's a special anointed night. <laughs> um, so bring every family member you have. And the kids will be singing a special. How many of y'all love to see the kids? I love to see the kids. I think they're adorable. So anyway, I want you all to clear your weekend for those things. And let's, let's be the church family. Okay, not just in church, but outside of church. Let's remember that we are a church family. And that means also outside these doors. So with that said, uh, my husband back here on the soundboard. How y'all been doing? Good. All right, praise the Lord. We're going to praise the Lord tonight. We're going to worship in our freedom that the Lord Jesus has given us. And Terry's coming for the tithe. <laughs> Kingdom Builders offering and tithes. Praise the Lord. And I'm looking forward to that family weekend, Sarah. Praise the Lord. That's always fun. That was so fun last year. You could, well, I thought it was going to be up there. <laughs> but you can give from your seat. Or we've got a, you can give back there with your credit card, or you can drop with the envelope in the gray box back on the wall. Oh, there it is. You can go to my church, Georgetown, give from your seat, the kiosk back there, and the old school envelope, which I still use. And also, the ushers will be around to receive the offering here as they get ready. And they've got their mask on, and they'll be holding it. So uh, people won't have to touch it. Just drop your offering in there. And did you know in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, it says the Lord loves a cheerful giver? Praise the Lord. And, and if you go on and read down through there, it just, there's so many good things. Now he who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Well, that's a promise that we have. Praise God. And you, and you don't want to be like the crowd, the police officer. They asked him, he was a, a new police officer, just new on the force, and they were giving him his last examination. And they said, what would you do to disperse an angry crowd and he said I would get the bullhorn and I would announce that we are going to receive an offering so <laughs> so we don't want to be that way <laughs> we, want, we, we want to run the gift to the offering because we know what good it does when it gets in the hands of the right people and our pastor makes sure and our board makes sure it gets in the right hands that we can reach the world we got money going around the world our kingdom build is offering. It helps start churches here. It helps missionaries start churches. It helps in disaster areas. There's just so much good that comes out of it. And you know, as we help with that, we get to be a part of that work. It'll be written down in heaven. And I want to encourage you in that. I love to help out. 
wherever we can because and God has always blessed me doing it. And he will bless you. And he will increase so that you can give more and have more for your own home too. Praise God. Father, thank you for being so faithful. Thank you for taking care of us. And thank you, Lord, that, that how you bless the stewards, the good stewards that trust in you with tithes and offerings and helping the missionary and building the kingdom, you want to give them more and more to be good stewards of. And I thank you for that, Lord. And thank you even for the greater promises to take care of us spiritually and to touch people's lives that they can reach their family and friends, which is way more important than, than any prosperity, any kind of monetary gain on this earth. And you bless them both. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. We give you our adoration. We give you our thanks. We give you all of the glory. Amen. Hallelujah. No, you bring hope to the hopeless and light to those in the darkness and death to life. Hallelujah. Now I. joy to homes that are broken I see you
lift you high as we breathe as we lift up to you.
think about the Lord. That's the song, When I Think About the Lord. I like to keep him on his toes back there. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We sing of your goodness. We, we bless you, God, for your goodness. We thank you. Hallelujah. When I think about the Lord, how He saved me, how He raised me, how He filled me up with the Holy Ghost, and He healed me to the uttermost. And when I think about the Lord, how He picked me up, turned me around, and He placed my feet on solid ground. Here we go. Makes me 
you, Lord. Lord, we fix our eyes on you. We fix our eyes on you. For you are holy. Yes, you are holy. Thank you, Jesus. We fix our eyes on you. Yes, Lord. We fix our praise on you. For you are holy. Yes, you are holy. Hallelujah. Lord, we fix our eyes on you. We fix our praise on you. For you are holy. Yes, you are. You are holy. We fix our eyes on you. We fix our praise on you. For you are worthy. For you are worthy. Yes. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. So we fix our eyes on you. We fix our praise on you. For you are worthy. Yes, you are worthy. Oh, Lord, you are worthy. So we put our eyes on you. We give our praise to you. We give our praise to you. For you are holy. For you are holy, Lord. You are holy, Lord. Yes, Jesus. So we put our eyes on you. We give you the praise. We give a praise to you, for you are worthy, for you are worthy, yes you are, hallelujah, he is worthy, church, oh, he is worthy, he is worthy, we praise you, Lord, hallelujah, pour out your praise, church, pour out your praise, don't hold it back, don't keep it in. Oh, but lay it all down at his feet tonight. Hallelujah. Lord, you're worthy. You are the lifter of my head. You are the lifter of my head. Thank you, Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith. Hallelujah. I just want to give quick instructions right now we're not going to move forward yet uh, the scripture talks about God inhabits our praises and what that means is we begin to praise him he begins to his presence begins to be manifest in our lives begin to feel his presence you know you can come into the church which is God's house and never feel God or you can come to the church and you can feel God and really it's not up to God as it's up to you okay and so I just want to encourage you right now some of you might not understand what praise is. It's very simple. You know, music was created by God, given to man for the sole purpose of worshiping Him. There's a lot of other music out there that doesn't worship God, and they're just missing the point. The point of music is to worship and to praise God. So as Rachel plays, it doesn't even matter what she's singing, I want you to begin to praise God. Now, it's very simple. You can do it with your posture. You can do it with your body, like lifting your hands or kneeling. You can do it through your voice. It can be just, Lord, I just worship you tonight. I praise you tonight. You can begin to thank him for things. Thank him for his presence tonight. So as Rachel plays, James, turn it up. I just want you to privately praise God, and I want you to experience how the atmosphere changes for you. Okay? Let's begin right now. Begin to call out praises to him. You don't have to be out loud verbally for everybody else to hear, but loud enough for you to hear. Begin to praise him. Begin right now just to praise Him. If you want to kneel, if you want to let stand, whatever you want to do. If you want to sit, begin to praise Him out loud. Loud enough for yourself to hear. Who am I that the highest King would welcome me? I was lost. I was lost, but He brought me in. Oh, His love for me. Praise you, Lord. It's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child. Yes, I am. 
thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. You're worthy, Lord Jesus. Thank you that we can be in your presence tonight. God, I thank you for the manifest presence of your Holy Spirit here tonight. I ask, Lord God, you'd condition us and prepare us for your word this evening. Father, speak to us. Open our hearts, open our minds, and open our ears to receive your truth tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you tonight. You can be seated. I want you to know the atmosphere changes when we involve ourselves in worship and praise to God. Uh, all through the scripture, you read about worship. You read about music. It's something that accompanies uh, people as they uh, seek the Lord through, through praise. And it has a purpose in, 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 in ministerial uh, uh, circumstances or the church or the temple of the Old Testament. It, it, it accompanied the word of God. And the reason it accompanies the Word of God is because it helps condition our hearts, prepare our minds to receive. It helps us to become sensitive to God. And so that's the reason worship is so important in the church. You, you've got to have worship when you bring the Word so that people can, can, can gather themselves into the presence of God to be more prepared and ready. So I just want to encourage you in your worship tonight. Open your Bibles this evening as we now go to the Word. Acts chapter 25 is where we're beginning, going to be beginning. I started last week with this, talking about disasters. Disasters are an aspect of all of our lives. They've always been around. And the Apostle Paul was no stranger to disasters. We can learn a lot from Paul and how he dealt with disasters we saw last week him being arrested, him being put in prison. This imprisonment lasted years. Uh, it was uh, an unjust imprisonment. He didn't deserve to be arrested or imprisoned. However, Paul saw this arrest and imprisonment as an opportunity. He used disaster as his platform. He preached the good news of God's grace to people he would never have gotten the opportunity to do so to leaders, kings, emperors. Now we're going to follow that thread tonight, through tonight and next week, Sunday night, about what else is coming out of disaster. You see, Paul's not done experiencing disasters. As a matter of fact, things are going to get worse before they get better for Paul, as you'll see tonight. In just a matter of days, his next disaster We'll begin what is going to happen. That's what we want to look at. Chapter 25. If you've got your Bibles, turn to them. I'm going to have you highlight or underline a few places tonight. If you don't have your Bible, if you're using a phone Bible, you can highlight with that. I'll have the words up here. But we're going to start in 25, verse 8. Paul has been arrested. He's been in prison for at least two years at this point. He's been preaching and talking about the grace of God and now he's standing before people who are trying him to find out his innocence or guilt and here we begin in verse 8 Paul made his defense he said I have done nothing wrong against the Jewish law I've done nothing wrong against the temple I've done nothing wrong against Caesar Fester, Festus, excuse me, not Fester, that'd be a whole nother person. It's not Uncle Fester, it's Governor Festus. But you can read it however you want. Wishing to do the Jews a favor, this was the governor, said this to Paul. Are you willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? And Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. You see, the Jews were trying to get him back to Jerusalem because they had uh, conspired to murder him. Paul understood these things. He says, I've, 
I've not done any wrong to the Jews, as you yourselves know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving of death, I don't refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, then no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with his council, he declared, You have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. So Paul is making his defense. Now, I want you to understand, this is not disaster. This is persecution. We're going to get to the disaster, but right now, he's not, this, this is just plain, flat out persecution. Did you know that sometimes, just like Paul, you're going to have to defend yourself? There's going to be times where you are going to have to stand up for what you believe in, and you're going to have to proclaim to the people around you that you are innocent of what the charges they put upon you are. Discernment must be used in those uh, circumstances so that you do the right thing at the right time because there were also times where Jesus did not make a defense for himself. So you must know the will of God to do this. But there will be times you must defend yourself against false accusations. There will also be times, are you ready for this, that politics will keep you confined. There are times when politics will put you in jail. As we can see right here, Festus, the governor, wishing to do the Jews a favor. You see, he wanted to curry favor with the Jews as the new governor. He wanted to be on their good side. He wanted to, he wanted to continue to, to, to have that position. He wanted the Rome to, to, to see that he was doing a good job and that he had favor with the people. And so he's trying to please the Jews. And even though he'd done nothing wrong, he was kept in prison for years, confined because of politics. Again, this is not disaster, it's persecution. Paul was not afraid of persecution. Paul realized that this injustice was going to serve and further God's plan. Persecution of the church will always further God's plan. Whether that be through politics, something unjust, having to make it and defend yourself, all those times it will always go to further God's plan. An angel of the Lord had actually appeared to Paul prior to this time, a couple years before, Acts 23, 11, if you want to look at it. It was right after he was initially arrested, and that angel told him that he was going to be in Rome testifying of the good news. So he knew where he was going already. So now Paul appeals to Caesar, and he says, To Caesar you shall go. So Paul is now headed off to see the emperor. I want you to turn to chapter 27. I'm going to read this whole chapter tonight. I need to know you're ready for that. I know our Bible studies, we go through a chapter or two, but we don't always do that on Sunday night. Can you guys handle that? No? Should we stop and worship some more? Get you prepared? We can get that heart ready, get that head ready. Rachel, you want to come back, play some music? Are you ready? Rachel, come on back. Rachel, where are you at? she gone? I can't see. I got lights in my eyes. Oh, you guys lucked out. You better get ready real quick. Here we go. Troy, put the map up. This is a, a picture of Paul's journey of where he's going to go. This journey is a, a, by ship. He's going to be sailing to Italy. Chapter 27, verse 1. Follow me now. Pay attention. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy... Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion, and his name was Julius. So all the boat, there was some prisoners. They weren't all prisoners, but there was a handful of prisoners, including Paul. They were handed over to a centurion, who's a leader of the military, and he's going to take care of them and make sure they're going to where they're going. He belonged, it says, to the Imperial Regiment. It says, we boarded a ship from Andramatium, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia. We put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was also there with us. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, that centurion, in his kindness to Paul, 
actually allowed Paul to go to his friends so they might be able to provide for his needs. From there, we put out to sea again. We passed along the sea of Cy uh, the Lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. There, the centurion, Julius, found an Alexandrian ship that was sailing for Italy, and he put us on board that ship. We made slow headway for many days. He had difficulty arriving off of Nidus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the Lee of Crete. That's opposite Salmon. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens near the town of Lycia. Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them. He said, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous. I can see that this voyage is going to bring great loss to the ship, to cargo, and even to our own lives. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. But this was a harbor in Crete that was facing both southwest and northwest. When a gentle wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity. So they weighed anchor, sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm. It could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it. We were driven along, and as we passed to the lee of a small island called Cauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself in order to hold it together. Because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor, they let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging on and on, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. Now I want you to underline or highlight right there. We finally gave up all hope of being saved. They held on to some hope for a while. They were in the throes of a major disaster. It was difficult prior to this point, but right now, after all of this, not seeing sunlight, not seeing the sky, not seeing the stars. It was nothing but the pounding of this raging storm for days on end. After throwing over everything, they, listen, they're doing everything they can to try and save themselves. They're trying to hold out for as many days as possible to prevent their demise. They're literally taking by their own hands the cargo of the ship and tackle of the ship. You know, that's important stuff. And they're throwing it overboard, trying to delay, trying to gain enough time for them to survive this. Maybe the storm will subside. Maybe we'll get past this. Maybe we'll be able to save ourselves. But the storm continued to rage. It continued to go on. And finally, everyone except Paul, I would say, because Paul already knew where he was going, had given up all hope of being saved. Now, I want you to understand something. In underlining that we finally gave up all hope of being saved, I want you to know something. God has a plan in all of this. This is not by accident. This is on purpose. God says, let them give up all hope. Let them see that they have absolutely no power to save themselves. They've tried everything they can. They've thrown everything overboard. They've held out for as long as they can. And finally, God says, let them get to the end of their rope. And then they will finally look to me. When they have no hope left, they'll find true hope. God has this plan. Listen to me, church. Some people in your lives, maybe some people here tonight, will have to be subjected, subjected to major catastrophic 
disasters before they'll find Jesus. They have to come to the end of the rope. They'll have to try to outlast the storm. They'll have to, with their own hands, try to save themselves until they come to the point when they realize there is nothing left they can do and then they'll find true hope. Disaster will lead to salvation for many people. Now I want to continue. By the way, let me just also say this. Paul warned them about this. Paul told them, and you'll see it here. It's actually how it begins. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul then stands up before them and he says to them, listen to me. Men, you should have taken my advice not and not sell for Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. Can I just say tonight, if somebody more spiritual than you gives you spiritual advice, you need to listen to them. You could save yourself a lot of storm, a lot of headache. You could even save yourself disaster if you wouldn't be too hard-headed to receive spiritual counsel. If someone more spiritual than you gives you spiritual counsel, listen to them. You don't have to go down that road. They didn't listen. But here's what happens. This is crazy. Verse 22, but now I'm going to urge you. Men, keep up your courage. Don't give up. Don't lose hope because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Here is what he says. He said, last night, an angel of God to whom I belong, to whom I serve, came and stood beside me. How many people know that God is beside us in these storms? And he said, don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. Now listen. <laughs> it's in times of disaster that the people of God are truly tested in their prayer walk. In this disaster, I don't believe for one second Paul thought he was going to die. In this disaster, I don't, because Paul, years prior to this, had had another meeting with the angel of the Lord, and the angel of the Lord told him, you're going to Rome. Paul knew where he was going. He knew what was going to happen. But Paul, throughout this storm, from probably the moment they made the decision to not listen to him, began to pray. By doing what they should not have done, by not listening to Paul, they had sealed their own fate. They were really killing, them, killing themselves. What they didn't know, though, that they had was an advocate. Paul was in the boat with them. Paul, in moments of disaster, was on his knees. And Paul is not praying for himself. Paul already knows I'm going to Rome. He probably was thinking, who knows what God's going to do to save me. Everybody else is going to be dead. But like Jonah, I'm probably going to ride on a fish all the way to Italy. He knew he was going to be safe. What he didn't know was about all of his passengers. Some were close to him. Some were in ministry with him that attended him. The man writing the, the letter here, for example. Others were other prisoners. One was a centurion. Other people on the boat that had nothing to do with any of this were on the boat with him. And he knows that if this disaster comes upon them and if this, and, and, and if this ship breaks up and falls apart, they're going to die. They're going to be lost and none of them know Jesus. And so he begins in this disaster to get on his knees night after night, day after day, beginning to pray and seek the grace of God for their lives. I want you to underline something. Listen to me. This is God's message for you tonight. Listen. Underline, God has given you the lives of all who sail with you. That's your word tonight, church. Listen to me. God's just not saving you. He's using disaster to open up opportunity because it's not His will that any would perish. 
And God's going to save and spare every life on that boat with you. But you've got to be like Paul. You've got to be an advocate for them. You've got to get on your knees and you've got to start praying for them. You've got to start pleading for their lives. You've got to ask God to soften their hearts. You've got to ask God to, to spare their lives and to cause them to, to strip the, the lies from their heart that the devil has told them and begin to sow seeds of truth in their heart. As Paul's praying for his shipmates, this angel of God comes and visits him. And in this moment of disaster, a revelation of truth comes to him. A revelation from the angel. God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. And he reports this to them. He tells them this. And then he says, so keep up your courage, men. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. People need to see that faith. They need to understand the word that you're giving them is not your own word. It's the word of God. And God's word does not fail. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. With disaster comes hope. With disaster comes salvation. We must intercede for the people who are making bad ungodly, worldly decisions, when they don't take the advice of the spiritual around them, we must begin to intercede so they don't meet their demise. If not for us, listen to me, church, if not for us, they will die in the storms of life. I see uh, in the lives of, of of Big T, Pastor Terry and Marla, this desire to save lives from the storms. We spend time together every week. We go out for staff lunch and spend time together in the office and pray for one another. I see how he interacts with people in public, people that have no spiritual bone in their bodies, but we get opportunity to witness to them, tell them about Jesus, invite them to church. Big T cares about them. He asks about their life. He asks what they're going through. Is there anything I can pray for you about? And he's very faithful. He writes down his little book. He's old, so he doesn't use his phone. He uses a notepad. Show us that notepad. You got it in your pocket right now? Use a notepad. He going to write you down in there. He and Marla's going to be praying for you. If he writes you down, you guarantee it. Every day, every week, they're going to be praying for you. There's people that he meets one time and he starts praying for them and interceding. And they don't got a spiritual bone in their body. They're making one bad decision after the next. You can tell by their request to him that they've already, you know, they're, they're gone. That's the way our lives should be. Interceding for the demise. Knowing that it's only us that stand between them and hope. Let's read on verse 27. On the fourth night, we're being driven along by the Adriatic Sea. It was about midnight, and the sailors sensed there we were approaching land. So they took soundings. They found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again. It was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors and from, the stern, from the stern, and they prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. And then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you can't be saved. So the soldiers then cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. I can just picture that in my mind. Some of them are trying to escape so desperately. You know, they know they're getting ready to run aground. They're like, hey, we've got to get this lifeboat, get out of here. Hey, we're going to go drop some anchors off the bow. They're lowering that thing as fast as they can, got the ropes out. And then Paul knows what's going on. I don't know if Paul even seen him. Maybe it was an angel again. Hey, they're trying to escape. Tells the centurion, they're over sitting there trying to lower it, and suddenly it just, it just drops. They're like, look up. They done cut the ropes on them. They're trying to escape. 
He's trying to get away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all. He said, you need to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you've been in a constant suspense. In the last 14 days, you've gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. And now I urge you, take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread. He gave thanks to God in front of them all. And then he broke it and he began to eat. They were all encouraged. They ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. I want you to underline this. They were all encouraged. They were all encouraged. Verse 36. Amidst the destruction, amidst the storm, amidst this disaster, Paul's peace flies in the face of all of our natural human reflexes. They're still trying to save themselves. <laughs> While some are frantically trying to escape the boat, Paul was giving thanks to God. He was breaking bread, encouraging the other 275 passengers on board the ship. That is us. From disaster comes peace. Paul is the pinnacle of peace. He is the epitome of peace. In all of this turmoil, he alone has peace. He has already given them hope. He's already shared with them that they're going to survive. He reminds them not a single hair on their head will be lost. And then with thanks to God, he breaks bread and has them all sit down and eat together and reminds them of their salvation. From this disaster comes peace. Listen to me. In disaster... God wants you to bring peace. He will reveal His supernatural peace through your life, through your behavior that flies in the face of all of our human reflexes. He wants to use you as His example. Finish up this chapter and we'll be done tonight. Right, you can come back. When daylight came, they didn't recognize the land but they saw a bay with a sandy beach. They decided to run aground if they could. So cutting loose the anchors that they had dropped earlier, they left them in the sea. By the way, they found those anchors. I was watching one of those Discovery Channel things somewhere. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea. And at the same time, they untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and they made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and then it ran aground. The bow stuck fast. It wouldn't move. So there it is stuck in the, in the surf. And as the, 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 the waves continued to just hit it over and over again, the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. It's beginning to sink. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life, and so he kept them from carrying out that plan. He ordered that those who could swim to jump overboard now and get to land, the rest were to uh, take planks or other pieces of ship and float in on those. In this way, every single one of them reached the land safely. Now, Paul told them, he prophesied this. He told them exactly what was going to happen. Think a few days back, he's in the ship. They're all lost hope, and he comes to them, and he says, I've got great news. <laughs> I knew I was going to be saved, but God told me now he's going to spare every single one of you. I've been interceding for your lives. And here's what he says, and I want you to go back and underline this in verse 22. Highlight this. Only the ship will be destroyed. Only the ship will be destroyed. Hope is not lost, but salvation has come. It's only the vessel which will be destroyed. Not a single life on that boat was lost that day. Listen to me. This vessel might be destroyed, but my life will be spared. The vessel is going to take a beating. This vessel is going to fall apart, but my life will be spared. This is not just disaster. This is my Savior at work. He allowed these things to happen. 
He put them in the path of these men to bring them to salvation. He wanted them to see that He was there. That He was their true hope. The world might be a mess. Perhaps you're here tonight. Your life is a mess too. Maybe your body is wasting away. But you know what? It doesn't matter. It's just a vessel. What's important is that God will save your life. Life. God will save every life that puts their faith and their trust in Him. While the world breaks up all around us, while people are desperately hanging on to the ship, people will realize that these useless things we hold on to are not the answer. That they cannot save themselves by throwing things out. Jesus is the only way to salvation. Jesus is the only answer. And if we hold on to Him, although our possessions may be lost to the sea, our souls will be safe. From disaster comes salvation. This world is experiencing one disaster after the next. And our personal lives from time to time will experience disasters. They're not only opportunities and platforms for us to use to preach the gospel. They're more than that. They mean salvation. They mean hope for all those on the boat with us. See, there are people everywhere that are dying in their sins. Stand with me if you're able to all over the sanctuary. There are people who have no hope. They have nowhere to turn. And they're looking to you. There are people that are experiencing disaster and have left to their own decisions, they just rush themselves in to greater demise. Once they're there, they try every other way to escape but the right way. They let down the lifeboat. They try to run out. They try to get away. And if we don't intervene, they'll be lost to the sea. If we don't recognize we have a responsibility, if you're the only one saved in your family, that's all that matters. You're there to save them. If you're only one saved at your work, that's all that matters. You're there to save them. If there's more than one believer in that group, then praise the Lord. You've got more than one working. We have a responsibility for those around us. We don't just escape the ship and let everybody else drown. We save everybody with us. And we get on our knees in prayer. And we intercede until God gives a way out. Until He provides that salvation for them. You might be here tonight and you need that kind of salvation. You need to put your trust and your faith in Jesus. And if that's you, then I ask you and challenge you tonight to lay everything down and accept Jesus' salvation. He died so you wouldn't have to. He gave His life so that your sins could be forgiven, so that you could have eternal life in heaven forever. If you've already been saved, then I want you to see this challenge tonight. God brings and allows disaster in our lives. He's using it to his advantage. We must be about his business. I'm going to close in a word of prayer, and after that, you guys may feel free to pray. I want you to spend some time talking to the Lord tonight. Whatever God's laid on your heart, maybe you just want to begin to intercede for others in your life. Maybe you need to pray for yourself for something. If you need special prayer tonight, the pastors will be up here. We'd love to pray with you. When you're done talking to the Lord, you may be dismissed on your own, okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you provide hope, salvation. There is no devastation, no destruction, no disaster that doesn't have a purpose. God, you will take what the enemy meant for evil and you will use it for your good. Lord, you bring salvation out of the storm. You bring hope from the stormy seas. Lord, and I pray that we would be the propagators of that good news. Help us, Lord God, to remember our role and our purpose in this world. And I pray for all lost souls here tonight to be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Find a place now. You can spend some time with the Lord before you leave.
you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone and I'm no For I am a child of God And I'm no longer a slave to fear For I am a child of God Your love has called my name And I've been born again Into your family Your blood flows through my veins And I'm no longer But I am a child of God No, I'm no longer a slave to fear And I am a child of
Jesus brings freedom. 